Um, so my name is Alex Knox, and this year I was an intern at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, I worked with Mr. Stephen Conard to develop a system which would automate the process of observing an occultation. And so here I'd like to describe why I decided this year to focus on that project, um, and then how I developed that automated system and how I automated it. The study of small solar system bodies through occultations makes important contributions to our understanding of the solar system as a whole. And so expanding the collection of data from occultations is of great value. One of the ways to increase the amount of data collected is to increase the number of observations which are conducted on any one event. More observations along an event path increase the number of chords of information across the occulting body. And so with that additional data, including both the positive and the negative results, uh, we can better constrain the size and the shape predictions that can be made based on those chords. Besides size and shape, more observations also increase the chances of detecting other features of occulting bodies like rings or satellites if they exist. A satellite, for example, is usually incredibly small even in comparison to the occulting body. And so it's, if it exists, it's very easy to miss in a recording. When satellites are recorded, especially if they've never been recorded before, then it's usually by chance. And so increasing the number of individual observations which are made on one event increases the likelihood that if one of those features does exist, that it's detected in one of the recordings. However, one of the greatest constraints for increasing occultation data collection is the number of people who are both available and willing to conduct observations. Currently, one person can record from multiple locations using prepoints, but the setup of those requires time and it also has to be done in the dark. Both of those requirements places a limit on the number of stations which one person could reasonably operate for any event. So the goal of my project this year was to create a method of automatically observing an occultation. This would make collecting data on occultation events more efficient by allowing one person to record from many different locations without the time constraints which are currently required to do so. To create a fully automated system, there are two main components which would need to be addressed. The first is the physical device itself. It would need to be transportable so that the system can be taken to wherever the event path happens to cross. It also needs to be able to be loaded and unloaded easily. And both of those put constraints on the size and the weight of the system. It would also need to be somewhat protected physically from dew or rain or any sort of other unexpected event since there won't be someone there to make sure that the technology is safe. And then the second component is the actual autonomous nature of the technology. What it is about the, the system which actually makes it automatic. The system needs to be able to go through the entire observation process start to finish without receiving any sort of additional input from a person. This second component, the actual automation, is a bit less straightforward to implement than the first. In fact, when I was first approaching the problem, I wasn't even sure if it was going to be possible. So I focused that this year on that second component, whether or not it is possible to conduct an observation entirely autonomously. And if so, how one might approach that problem. If I could prove that it is possible to achieve that goal, then that would justify further investigation into the first component. So I started off with 
a relatively normal setup for observing an occultation manually. <laughs> it used a Celestron Nexstar 5SE telescope with the StarSense AutoAlign attachment. The camera was a Runcam Night Eagle 2 Pro. And then both the telescope and the camera were connected to a computer by USB cables. And the entire system was powered with a Celestron battery. I also added on an AstroZap Dew Shield after we ran into some problems early on with condensation. And while the precise products that make up the setup aren't really all that important, um, the main thing of note here is that all of the pieces which go into the actual observation process are all connected back to the computer. So with everything connected to the computer, my next goal was to get the system so that an observation could be run entirely through software on the computer, even if it was still having to be run manually. After all, clicking buttons on a computer could conceivably be automated, but trying to automatically push the buttons of the telescope's hand controller would be a whole other issue. I used Celestron's CPWI software to run everything that involved directly interacting with the telescope. So the initial alignment process and the initial slewing to the target star. This accounts for everything that would normally be done through the telescope's hand controller. So that removed the daunting possibility of having to deal with physical buttons. I also used IOTA's video capture software to record twice during the process, once after the initial positioning of the telescope as input for a plate solve, and the second time at the time of the event as normal. The plate solve was run through Astro Shatia, which accepted FITS images as input and then processes them correct the telescope's alignment but since the video capture software saves files in a .avi format, I used ImageJ to convert the file format appropriately. Despite the alignment capabilities of the telescope and the star sense, it's still quite likely that the alignment won't be exact. And when the telescope slews to the target star's coordinates, the star may or may not be visible. Normally, what the plate solve accomplishes could be done by a person making small adjustments to the telescope's position um, until the star is visible. But the plate solve is important to include in the software design for an automatic system because there won't be a person there to make those adjustments. And so the plate solve takes the place of that human check and ensures that the star is recorded properly. So the whole observation process can be condensed into five main steps which need to be addressed through automation. The first, in CPWI, the telescope is lined and slews to the target star's coordinates. Then a short recording is taken. Third, the recording is converted from a .avi format to a FITS format. And fourth, the new image is given as input to a plate solve which corrects the telescope's alignment. And then finally, uh, the normal recording is taken at the event time. Based on the choices of hardware and software, an observation can now be conducted entirely through the computer. And while this still requir requires human input, all of that input is reduced to things like clicking buttons or selecting something from a drop-down menu or inputting something into a text field. So at this stage, all it would take to completely automate the process would be to find a way to address those buttons and text fields without actually having a person there to do it. So in other words, I needed something to mimic a person interacting with the user interface of the different pieces of software I was using throughout the observation process. While there are several programs which actually have that capability, I chose to use a program called AutoIt because it was free and it was also very straightforward and intuitive. So it would be easy for me to learn and to use 
but it would also be easy for other people to understand. AutoIt can be used to automate the user interface of Windows programs by imitating user input on aspects of the interface, like the buttons and the text fields. And the program is able to interact with each component of the interface by referring to the unique name which the computer has assigned to each feature in a user interface. So say that there's a button you want to click. Maybe it's the button that starts the telescope's alignment or the button to start slewing the telescope. In order to automate that step, you would only need to know the name that the computer has assigned to that button. AutoIt can be downloaded with a helper application, which makes finding that name very easy. And once you have that name, you can input it as an argument to a, one of AutoIt's built-in functions. So for the example of clicking a button, the function is called control click. But depending on the exact, what type of feature you're trying to automate or what you want that component of the interface to do, the exact function which you call could change. But the fundamental process of finding the component's name and giving it as an argument to an AutoIt command is the same for anything that you try and automate. So using that method, any one interaction with the user interface, so clicking a button one time, uh, selecting a checkbox, each one of those is reduced to a single line of code. And putting many of these functions together, the code becomes a sort of script where each line represents one action. Compiling, compiling all these actions into a script also makes the process very organized and you can automate much more complex tasks instead of just the individual button clicks. So I used AutoIt's automation methods for everything through CPWI and also everything involving the plate solve in Astro Tortilla. However, in order to automate using AutoIt's methods, you need to be able to access that name. Most user interfaces are written in a standard way for Windows programs, and so each component has a name that AutoIt can access, and the scripting works fine. But in some cases, the way the user interface was built didn't match the standard Windows design, and so some of the buttons and the features that I wanted to automate couldn't be accessed in the same way. So the first program where I encountered that problem was with ImageJ, when I was trying to convert the video taken by the camera into a file format that the plate solve would accept. Luckily, ImageJ had its own built-in scripting language, so I was able to write a separate script which converted the file format. And that external script that I wrote from ImageJ could be called from within the overarching AutoIt script. So I was able to get around ImageJ's incompatibility with AutoIt without having to sacrifice any of the organization and simplicity that had led me to choose AutoIt in the first place. The video capture software also wasn't compatible with AutoIt, but IOTA scripting or IOTA software has the capability to schedule recordings well in advance. So automation of the recording steps wasn't actually necessary. But for the majority of Windows programs, AutoIt scripting works well. And with it, I was able to create very simple and intuitive scripts, which could account for the majority of the user interaction that would normally take place during an observation. So here's a quick overview of what the scripts I wrote actually accomplish. At the most broad level, there are two scripts which group together related actions that need to happen at around the same time. The timing for the start of the first script and for the start of the second script, which I'll talk about later, can be set through Windows Task Scheduler, which is a program that comes built in on any Windows computer. So, after the first script is started, 
it connects the telescope to the computer and begins the auto align procedure, which are both actions that are conducted through the CPWI software using regular AutoWit scripting. The script then rotates the telescope counterclockwise, which is the opposite direction to how it was rotating during the alignment process. And this step accomplishes what might normally be done by the cord wrap option provided in the hand controller of at least the telescope that I was using, which prevents the telescope from ever rotating more than 360 degrees in any location, in any direction um, during the alignment process or do it during any other sort of movement. Unfortunately, when I was writing the scripts, CPWI didn't support that feature. And so this rotation step is meant to address the same issue. The last step in the first script is slewing the telescope to the coordinates of the target star. The precise coordinates would need to be entered before every different occultation event, but that's something that can be done as soon as the coordinates are known. The next step is to take a brief recording of wherever the telescope is pointing, wherever it currently thinks the coordinates it was given are based on its alignment. And that recording is scheduled in advance through the video capture software. After the recording, the second script begins, again, scheduled through Windows Task Scheduler. The script calls the external image day program in order to convert the file formats. And then back to using regular auto it commands, the extracted image is inputted into the plate solve software. And the telescope's alignment is corrected based on the plate solve immediately after. After the second script finishes, the telescope should be correctly aligned with the target star in the field of view. And at that point, the final video can be taken, the actual observing part. Um, one more thing that I'd like to point out about the script Throughout the process, there are several places where the script needs to pause until a process finishes running. It would be really bad, for example, if the, teles or the script tried to start rotating the telescope counterclockwise while it still wasn't done the self-alignment procedure. Those weight blocks, which are scattered throughout the flowchart, are meant to represent those pauses where the telescope needs to finish some sort of procedure. When AutoIt clicks a button, it doesn't know anything about what the button it clicked actually does. It doesn't know that it started a process, and it certainly doesn't know when that process is going to end. So it moves on to the next command immediately. Although AutoIt can't tell when processes end, there are AutoIt functions which can tell when a process starts. So in other words, it could detect when a window pops up with a certain name or when new text appears in a window. So for the example of the alignment, I, after the script clicks the button to start the alignment procedure, I had the script pause until it detected the name of the pop-up window, which would normally signal to a person that the alignment was complete. And writing the scripts in this way, with the pauses built in based on new windows popping up, instead of hard coding them in with the predicted number of seconds or minutes that it would take a process to complete, made the code much more flexible for when it's being run on the field, since every different alignment or positioning could take a different amount of time based on the exact observing conditions. And by coding it this way, I was able to remove any risk of the script trying to run two different procedures at once. So throughout the process of writing these scripts, I was testing the individual components, making sure that each line of the code, each command, was working the way it was supposed to. 
Once the scripts were mostly finished though, I was able to start working on testing the entire process to make sure that all of the commands would run appropriately during an actual observation. Due to the time constraints of the year, I unfortunately wasn't able to test it using a real occultation event, but instead I picked a star, something bright and recognizable, and a time, and then ran the scripts as if there was an occultation happening involving that star and at that time. Since to observe an occultation, all you really need to be doing is observe a specific star at a specific time. I consider this to be a suitable alternative for testing the system. The system was able to record the star I had picked at the time I had set, proving that it is able to accomplish all the criteria which would go into recording an occultation. The scripts, as they are, are able to go through all the steps of the observation process without any need for additional user input while the observation is running. The coordinates of the target star can be inputted into the script as soon as they're known. And the timing of the scripts, that is when they need to begin in order to be finished by the time of the event, can be set as soon as the event date and time are known. So that could be the date before the event or even earlier. The success of the system at being able to record an occultation automatically proves that the automation of the process is possible. Therefore, the idea that a similar system could be made, maybe one that is a little bit more portable, the idea that that could be created is not unreasonable. And looking into making the system more compact and more transportable would be a worthwhile undertaking for increasing the opportunities to collect data on an occultation event. Thank you, Alex. That was a fascinating uh, presentation and certainly th something we've long been interested in. Paul Maley uh, talked to me uh, more than 10 years ago about the possibility of eventually developing an automated occultation system whereby he could drop off telescopes along a road at night and they would all function automatically and then he would pick them up before sunrise and have uh, thereby having made multiple uh, observations. Uh, let me ask you some of the things that people have asked uh, on the uh, the uh, chat uh, window here. Um, I presume that this system does not work with when there is partial cloud cover. Um, it. I guess it depends on how much. Um, as long as it can still go through the alignment, and um, then it should be fine. Um, and as long as there isn't enough clouds to make the plate solve not run, it should be fine. Yeah. Um, so it, it would depend on just how cloudy it is. And is what is the approximate delay? I, I mean, I know it's variable depending on a lot of things about where the star is and the uh, observing conditions, but how long does it take from the time you turn on the system until uh, you think that you've you're pointing where you want to be. What, what's your estimate on that? Um, when I was testing it, the whole thing took about half an hour, but I was also in a place with a lot of trees, and so there wasn't actually all that much open sky. And so I think that the alignment and the place solve might have taken a little bit longer for me than it would all the time. So. All right. And let me ask another thing now. We use a technique called pre-pointing, where we leave a telescope pointed not at the target star, but rather at a star that's at a position in the sky where the target star will be at occultation time. And that is, we, we don't just point our telescopes at the target star at the moment of occultation when we set up multiple 
systems. So that my question then is, is this uh, designed to point right at the target star at the moment of occultation, or is it pointing at a pre-point area that will capture the target star at the time of the occultation? Um, it's pointing at the target star, but it starts pointing at it a little bit before the occultation mm -hmm. and um, then just tracks it throughout. So it, tra it actually is a tracking system. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions? Uh, I'm going to mute myself for just a moment. And if any of you need to pipe in with a question, please do. So I'm going to ask a question about uh, focusing. Let me repeat, can the system account for the need to change real-time focus or the need to increase or decrease the gain of the camera in real time? Um, not with the materials I was using. Yeah, most of us have encountered a, a, a focusing problem with pre-pointing in particular because the telescope changes temperature as it waits, say, four hours for an occultation to occur. So, uh, so often uh, 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 pre-point stations are poorly focused. Um, but that's another issue. I mean, I st still think this is a fascinating area and something that uh, some of us are probably going to want to try on an experimental basis to implement in our observations. So thank you, Alex, for an excellent presentation. Very excellent. And I'm delighted to, to have heard this. Uh, one more question. Uh, yeah, I also second Roger's comment. Excellent presentation. Were you able, the plate solving software that you incorporated, were you, I've noticed that some are non-local and require an internet connection to actually do the plate solve. Were you able to integrate one that is entirely local so that, so that a Wi-Fi connection is not needed? Yeah, so Astro Tortilla, you give it information about the type of camera and the telescope you have, and then it downloads um, the images it needs to run the plate solve without internet. And that, so that would be something you do as a pre-setup one time before you go out in the field? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, one more question. Go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to make sure I <laughs> push the right button to make this work. So this is fascinating, Alex, and thank you so much for taking the time to share this information. Uh, I have actually three questions. First one is how long does it take from start to finish when you wake up your system until it's ready to reserve, to uh, observe? And then could it loop so that if it fails to complete a step like alignment, uh, resume that step until it's successful before it starts a sequence of, uh, or a series of observations? And then finally, how small a system could this be run on? Could you run it on a small portable? A uh, computer that's uh, on a flash drive or something like that. Uh, and thank you in advance for your answer. Um, so the entire process takes about half an hour, or it took about half an hour for me. But again, I think that depends a lot on how much sky is visible, and then like cloud cover would also affect that. Um, so it's probably something that you'd want to test it being there and then before like actually running it completely automatically. Um, for, let's see, for looping, um, yes, I think that is possible. I didn't try looping with the alignment, but I did um, try doing that like running multiple plate solves in case maybe the first one didn't get it exactly right. And I was able to do that, like running two or three plate solves. Um, so I'm sure that it would be possible. And then for the size of the computer, I'm not entirely sure how small it could be because at least how I was doing it relied on um, having like, having the software up on the computer and running and it was just like, it was like it was running, but kind of just not having a person there. Like you could still see 
the mouse move as it was executing all the different commands. But I think it could run on anything small enough, but like where, where a person could still be using it. I don't know if that answers the question. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we're gonna move on now.